He told me when the music stopped, we could go. So we're up there. Oh, fine. Go ahead. Okay, we'll get started now. Uh, my name's Kevin Benton, and this is Carl Baldwin, and we're going to talk about uh, neutron networks, uh, segments of neutron, physical networks, and then the routed network stuff that Carl's been pushing that'll bring some changes to how traffic is actually carried by neutron underneath. So I'll go over the current uh, network API semantics. You know, what is, what is a neutron network? What is a segment in neutron? What is a, what is a FizNet? How do these all uh, mix together and translate into what actually gets put on the wire when instances send traffic to each other? And then Carl's going to cover the changes to support uh, networks that are spanning different broadcast domains that are all look like they're behind one net neutron network. And these are referred to as routed networks, and there's been a lot of discussion about it with large deployers over the last two cycles. So inside neutron, uh, we have these tenant-facing objects in the API. We have uh, the port, the subnet, and the network, which is what I'm going to talk about right now, and then we also have the routers, subnet pools, floating IPs, and security groups, but that's not part of this, this talk right now. Uh, so a port is, it has all the information that's required for a single device to get connectivity to the network. It has the IP address that ends up getting assigned to it, the security groups that it's members of, the MAC address, that kind of information. Then there's the subnet, which in Neutron is just controlling the IP allocation for ports that are attached to a network. The subnet doesn't have anything to do with defining broadcast domains or anything like that. It's purely an IP allocation thing inside of Neutron. So that has DHCP info, IP addresses that you get, that kind of stuff, uh, the gateway your instances will use, name servers, all that. Then there's the network, which in Neutron is the container for subnets and ports. So it kind of brings them together. So any port that gets attached to a network will get an IP address that's from a subnet that's also on that same network. And the high-level uh, guarantee that we kind of offer is an, a tenant can attach two ports to a network, and those two ports should be able to communicate with each other somehow without additional configuration. So in Neutron, we have core plug different core plugins. And the way a network is actually implemented underneath how that traffic is carried across the wire is really an implementation detail of the core plugin. So for this talk, I'm going to be mainly focusing on the ML2 core plugin and how it ends up realizing uh, this, how, how it ends up carrying network traffic. Because uh, another core plugin, like um, VMware NSX or something could end up doing something completely different. So this is all specific to ML2. Uh, right now, networks in ML2 are implemented as single layer two domains. So two ports that are attached to the same network will get IP addresses on the same subnet. They'll try to communicate with each other by directly sending an ARP request of saying, hey, where's the MAC address of this thing? And then sending a layer two frame directly over to the other um, VM. And it's kind of expected that ports will be able to communicate with, with each other using broadcast and multicast traffic, because ARP obviously is broadcast traffic. So if this is blocked, you have to do a lot of hacks to work around to make it look like to the VM that it has uh, broadcast connectivity or something. So from a tenant's perspective, if you're just a, a, a Neutron user, you're not an operator or anything, this is it. This is all you see for the network. You don't see all the nitty-gritty details of VLANs or VXLAN or GRE or anything like that. But for the operator admin use case, there's a lot of different ways to configure how a Neutron network ends up being carried across the wires in the data center. And that's where these visnets and segments come in. So a segment contains encapsulation details used to carry L2 traffic between the compute and network nodes. Uh, each network in ML2 has at least one segment that's associated with it. And inside this segment, it just has some basic details. Network type, which defines how the traffic is going to be encapsulated. So you could have VXLAN, VLAN, or there's also a special option called flat, which means there's no encapsulation at all. And then there's the segmentation ID, which is the details for the uh, encapsulation protocol. So in the VLAN case, this will be the VLAN tag that gets used to, uh, to tag the traffic, or in the VXLAN case, it'll be the VNID header. Uh, 
And then the physical network is uh, the, an identifier that defines which interface the agents will ultimately end up using to send the traffic on. So it's supposed to correspond to kind of a layer two network in the operator's network. Uh, and right now, multiple segments uh, on the same network in ML2 are assumed to be bridged together. This is a pretty rare use case outside of uh, hierarchical port binding, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, but there can be multiple segments in a neutron network, and we kind of just assume that they're connected together right now, but there's nothing explicit about that, and that's one of the changes that Carl will be talking about for routed networks. So we had segments, and then segments refer to physical networks for VLAN and flat use cases. Uh, a physical network is just an identifier that represents a real operator network that uh, Ethernet frames are going to be sent out on. So the agents have mappings uh, from FizNets to a specific bridge they're going to send something on. So if they have uh, a port that's connected to a network, and that network has a segment that says this belongs to FizNet external or something, the agent will have a mapping that says, okay, anything that goes to external, I know I have to send out this bridge external or something like that. For overlay protocols like VXLAN and GRE, that kind of stuff, there's no physical network provided because that just uses the compute host uh, kernel networking to send the traffic. It's all encapsulated in IP, so there's no bridge mappings in that case. Um, and each FizNet is meant to be a completely separate layer two domain. So the, the way that works in Neutron is VLAN IDs can be duplicated between different FizNets. So you can have 4,000 VLANs all used up on one FizNet and then have another FizNet with, all this, with the same 4,000 VLANs and they're meant to be different networks and uh, corresponding to different interfaces on the compute nodes. So here, this diagram just kind of shows how everything fits together. We have the networks on the left-hand side. These are the user-facing constructs. They don't see any of the segments or FizNets or anything like that. Network A is a, a VXLAN-based network, so it has one segment associated with it of the type VXLAN, and it has a segmentation ID of, type te of 10,000. And that means the VNI will have 10,000 on all the, uh, the VXLAN packets that it's sending around. And since that's an overlay protocol, it has no corresponding FizNet. Uh, networks B and C are VLAN type, and they just each have one segment, and they each get their own VLAN ID, and they correspond to a single internal FizNet. So that means when traffic is being sent by the agents, traffic for network B and network C will both be going out over the same physical interface when it actually goes into the data center. They'll just have different VLAN tags. Uh, network D is an example of a network that, might ha that has uh, two segments associated with it. It has a VLAN one that corresponds to the internal FizNet and a flat one that corresponds to this alt FizNet. So in the, you might have a use case where you have some SRIOV based nodes or something like that and they don't want to use any VLAN tagging or anything like that. They just want it sent untagged onto the network. And in that case, those ones might be bound to segment five, which goes out a special uh, FizNet description on the uh, compute nodes. And then external network, completely different segment, or completely different FizNet, so it is also a VLAN type, and it also uses VLAN uh, 100. So even though net the external network and network B have the same VLAN tag, they, they correspond to different FizNets, so they shouldn't overlap because they should go out different interfaces on the compute nodes. So the way this looks on the server-side configuration is you have... Uh, network VLAN ranges um, for ML2 that define a FizNet and a set of VLANs that can be used for each FizNet. So in this case, we have the internal FizNet. This says you can use VLANs from 10 to 4,000 when it's automatically allocating segments. And for the external physical network, it can use VLANs from 100 to 110. And for VXLAN, it's just a global pool of uh, VNIs that it's allowed to use. And then for the flat network, since there's no tags, this just defines, hey, there's this FizNet, it's called alt FizNet, and that, that allows it to be used when you're creating a network. On the agent side, the only thing the agent needs to know is how to map these FizNets to some interface that's actually local on the compute node. So this is saying anything that's going on internal FizNet, 
needs to be sent out on this bridge be our tenant. Anything that's going to a network that's on FISnet, external FISnet, needs to be sent out this BRX bridge. So all the agent needs is this mapping to tell it which interfaces to send traffic out when it's going to one of the corresponding FISnets. So segments are currently created as part of the network creation process. Uh, an admin is allowed to specify segment details. So if you're an operator and you want to set up networks specifically to use certain VLANs or not use a VLAN, for example, you can pass these extra provider options. So in this case, we're creating network B from that previous slide. So we say neutron network create, uh, network type VLAN, uh, physical network, internal FISnet, and segmentation ID 100. So that'll set it up as a VLAN network on the internal FISnet with a VLAN tag of 100. If this isn't specified, so if you have regular tenants or you're a regular tenant and you're creating a network, you won't be allowed to do this. So if this isn't specified in ML2, there's another option called tenant network types, and that will define the default type that ML2 tries to use. So it will if you have this set to VLAN, for example, it will try to use, create a VLAN segment for every neutron network that's created. It'll allocate from that pool of VLAN IDs that are set up for each FISnet. So since a neutron network can have multiple segments, and some they can even be the same type, how do we know which one is used for a given port? So when, when Nova creates a port for a VM or it's using a port for a VM, after it has decided uh, which host to place the VM on, it will populate this binding host ID field in the, in the port object. And uh, this triggers a process inside ML2 called port binding. And each driver iterates through, they, they see the host that this port is being bound to, and then each driver has its own knowledge about what agents it has running on that host, uh, what the capabilities are of that agent, and can then determine if it has the capabilities to bind it to one of the segments. So it'll see, this is a, um, coming in on, for example, on the OVS agent, it'll get a request and it'll say, uh, it's being bound on host A, and then it'll go and look at its agents and say, hey, I have an agent that's running on host A, and this is being done with uh, FISnet X, and I have, my agent has bridge mappings for FISnet X, so I know that it knows how to access that specific FISnet, so it'll say, okay, I can bind the port, and then that port will become bound to that specific segment. So every usable port in ML2 has been bound by this process, so an, and a port is bound to a specific segment inside of a neutron network. And none of this is visible to the tenant, but as an admin, you, you'll be able to see this by looking at the, the neutron port show. You'll see some provider details. Um, then in the case of hierarchical port binding, there are multiple ML2 drivers can become involved to get a single port connectivity to a network. Uh, the use case for this is typically an operator wants VLANs to be used for the communication between their compute nodes and their topper rack switches because there's no encapsulation overhead that has to be processed on the compute node. And then once it gets up to the topper rack switch, it switches to VXLAN and is then carried over the network. So you get the performance benefits of no encapsulation on the compute node and then you still get the scaling benefits of the number of VNIs available in VXLAN. Um, I don't want to talk too much about this. There's an, if you're interested in this, there's a detailed talk later today by uh, Bob Kakura called Understanding ML2 Port Binding, and that's a link to it there. So then the question comes up, well, what, what if operators don't want to offer L2 connectivity? Um, hierarchical port binding is something that requires drivers for your top rack switches in your data center, which might be managed by a different team, and they don't want to give control of that, um, with, even with hi without hierarchical port binding scaling, L2 networks beyond 4K VLANs is, is uh, not possible without switching to an overlay like VXLAN. And uh, some operators don't want to have overlays uh, running on their network. Um, additionally, some operators don't want tenants to kind of, to use virtual networking at all. They want tenants to just pick from one network or maybe two networks like production and development and just have these giant networks that tenants attach to. And in that case, if they do that with just an L2 network, they have these really huge uh, broadcast domains that become really expensive and difficult to scale. 
So that brings in this topic of routed networks, which I'm going to let Carl talk about now. All right, thanks, Kevin. So <clears throat> for me, this goes back about three years. Uh, when I first started at HP, we were, we were standing up Neutron in HP's public cloud. And we built this large L2 network for, for our external network with floating IPs and spanned this L2 network across uh, multiple availability zones and uh, probably over a thousand compute hosts. And we were planning to have a lot of floating IPs, or at least be able to have a lot of floating IPs on that network. And in, in looking at how that scaled and the, the, the issues that we had in building out that L2 network and, and where are we going to hit scaling issues with um, MAC tables and ARP tables and things and the routers and the switches, um, I started to think, well, what if we could route these? Um, instead of having a large L2, what if we could have a routing infrastructure and route down to a, a very small L2 segment within the network? So that, that got me thinking. And so over the, over the last three years, I've actually kind of thought of this in a lot of different ways and, and made a few proposals. And this is the one that stuck. And so last... One year ago in Vancouver, uh, the, the large deployers team, which is a working group within the, uh, within the ops track, they got together, I think it was the first time in Vancouver, um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but they got together and a lot of them talked and said, you know, we've got this unique network architecture that we, we want Neutron to map to, and, and they described their routed architecture. And another operator would say, well, we have our unique infrastructure that, that we want Neutron to map to, and they would describe their routed infrastructure. And we finally figured out that they all kind of looked the same. And they, uh, the large deployer team put together an RFE and, and filed it in Neutron, and that's when I picked up on it. And I said, hey, that, that's what I've been thinking about for a couple of years already. So, so let's do it. So that was kind of a, some wind in my sail, and it, it caught it, and we, uh, I've been trying to move forward with it ever since. The basic idea is, you know, whether it's a rack or a cell or, or a couple of racks, the basic idea is you've got a router on top of, of multiple segments within your network. And here I just showed a simple example with four racks, each with a top of rack router. Each one has its own L2 domain and its own subnets. And on top of that, there's, there's routing. I didn't show anything complex like a uh, the spine leaf or a class network or anything. I just, that big routers, whatever kind of routing you want um, that, that moves the packets between the L2 segments um, at layer three. So I'm just going to walk you through the changes. Um, Kevin's given you a good background of how FizNets and segments and, and things work. I'm going to walk you through the changes we're planning to make to make these FizNets and segments work and, and map to these routed topologies that, that some of us want. So the first, the first step was to take the segment, which already existed. Uh, ML2 has the concept of segment. A couple other of, of Neutron plugins have the concept of segment. In fact, anything that implements the provider net extension or the multi-provider net extension in Neutron has this concept of a segment. So the first thing was to promote that concept of a segment to, uh, from an implementation detail of the network to a first-class thing with, with a UUID and its own endpoint in the API, something you can go query you can say, list me all the segments that belong to this network. Um, and by Newton, we'll be able to create and delete segments from a network uh, with, without, uh, right, right now you have to create all your segments all at once at network create time. But, but we're going to relax that a little bit, allow you to create and delete so segments can come and go from a network uh, over the life cycle of the network. And we're exposing this as a service plugin, uh, so that now we have an endpoint, we have segments, we have, they have UUIDs, and uh, this is something we can work with. Uh, 
The next problem that you run, to, run into is um, segments have always been envisioned as multiple segments within one single broadcast domain. Uh, so a network is still one L2, uh, but, but we have different segments, and it, it was just kind of assumed that, and Kevin mentioned this, it was assumed that they were all bridged together somehow, so that if you have two ports on the network, they, they can get their L2 traffic between them, and that that was a guarantee. Well, that with routed networks, that's no longer a guarantee. We're not going to guarantee L2 connectivity. But how do we tell the difference? How do we tell the difference between an existing network with multiple segments and L2 connectivity throughout and a new routed network with multiple segments and no L2 connectivity between them, only L3 connectivity? And the way we're going to do that is um, the subnets that sit on a network, subnets will still associate with a network but we can optionally associate a subnet with a segment. And if you think about, you take the subnet, which is, uh, as Kevin said, just, it's just the container of addresses. It's really just the, the L3 addressing that you're using on the network. If you take that subnet and you associate it with one segment instead of just the network as a whole, that's how we tell the difference between L2 connectivity throughout and L2, or, and L2 connectivity that's just confined to a segment. Because now we've associated the segment with, the subnet with a segment, and so that subnet's only available, it's only viable on that segment, subnet. Uh, so your, uh, your broadcasts to that subnet uh, are going to be confined to that segment. So now subnets are optionally linking to segments. And we're going to add one new API, and actually this is the only new API that's tenant-facing. Um, we'll add a new L2 adjacency attribute on the network that reflects this so that end users can tell what to expect from a network, whether to expect L2 adjacency or not. And that, that's just going to be a, a true-false flag on the network. Um, we're not going to store it, we're just going to compute it on the fly. Uh, it'll be false if subnets are associated to segments and, and true otherwise. So now we, we've got subnets, we've got multiple L2 domains, each with its own addressing. Uh, the next problem is uh, how do we tell which hosts are connected to which, sub, uh, to which segment? Because now it matters. Um, when we create a port on a network, we can't just give it any IP address from the network. We've got to know which segment that port's going to be used on. And so then the next model element that we're adding in Neutron is this map from hosts to segments. Um, with ML2, we kind of get this for free because uh, Kevin showed you the bridge mappings that you configure uh, the agent with. We can use those bridge mappings which, which map uh, which map the agents to a FISNet, we can use those to derive a, a host to segment mapping. Um, so with ML2 and agent-based operation, all, all we need is, is a piece of code to, to receive those bridge mappings, derive the host to segment mapping, and store that in a new table uh, for mapping host to segments. And this, this mapping will be exposed through the API somehow associated to segments. I haven't figured out exactly how that's going to work, but um, an admin will be able to see the hosts that are mapped to any given segment within the network. Now what happens um, when you create a port on a network? I already mentioned that when you create a port, you can't just give it any IP address. And in fact, if you, if you create a port without port binding um, on a multi-segment net routed network, you can't give it an IP address at all. Uh, so we have the concept of deferred IP allocation. You can do a neutron port create uh, 
give it the network ID, and you'll get a port back. You'll, you'll know the UUI, UUID of the port. Uh, it won't have any port binding information, and it actually won't have any L3 information either. Because at that point, we don't know enough to give it an L3 address. And this, this is something that, that tripped up Nova a little bit, but uh, in the, in the let me talk it. New, Newton release, um, Nova will allow this deferred host binding um, so that we can coordinate Nova scheduling, Nova, Nova port binding with, with the IP allocation. And then we can wait until later, until a port update that actually gives us some host binding information to allocate the IP address. So now that gets into Nova scheduling a little bit. Um, this, is, this is actually one of the trickier parts of, of this project, and it, but it's turned out to be a really cool opportunity to work cross-project between Nova and Neutron. Um, the problem here is now you've got your, your IP addressing available diff differently throughout your network, and, you might have one segment that, that's used up all its IP addresses, where the other segments still have some availability. Well, when you go do Nova Boot, um, you don't want your instance to land on a segment that doesn't have any IP addresses available. So we want to make Nova scheduling IP address, IP availability aware, I guess. And this, um, this slide doesn't do the complexity any justice because there, there's a lot of complexity in here. Um, but what, what we've decided to do, and we talked about this yesterday in the, in the Nova Neutron design session, is the conductor, the Nova conductor, will have kind of a three-stage process, um, a, a pre-scheduling step, a scheduling step, and a post-scheduling step. And the, the idea is to stick everything we can do for preparation in the pre-step before we get into the scheduling step, because that's the part that, that's the part that kind of does allocations and, com and maybe commits some resources. Um, and that's, that's really the part that could be contentious and, and needs, needs to be atomic, isolated, all that, all that stuff. And then in the post scheduling, <clears throat> hold on. In the post scheduling step, that's the part where okay, now we've exited the, the, the super critical, possibly contentious section. Now we can go claim the resources and, and get things set up before we actually push this out to the compute host and, and boot the VM. So uh, with deferred IP allocation, we defer that IP allocation to the post-scheduling step. Uh, so Nova will actually do a, a port update in the post-scheduling step, look for an IP address to come back in the response. And um, most cases, everything's happy. They get an IP address. They go out to the compute host. But there is, there is a possibility of a race where Neutron may say, yeah, sorry, I just gave out my last one. I, um, I'm out of IP addresses. And, and we get an exception, and we just kick that back to the, the pre-scheduling step. And it, it's a pretty tight loop that um, and, and shouldn't happen often. It, it really will only happen when there's that last final race for the last IP address on a segment. Uh, the other thing that will affect, affect you when you go to router networks is uh, DHCP scheduling. It, if you're using the DHCP agent as it is today, uh, you'll find that DHCP will, will be scheduled to some random segment, and uh, your VMs may not be able to contact that DHCP server because, guess what, there's no L2 connectivity throughout the network. Uh, so we do have work in progress to, uh, to enhance the DHCP scheduler 
so that on a routed network, we make sure that all of the isolated segments are covered by, uh, by a DHP agent. Uh, so your network is no longer just scheduled to one or, or maybe two DHCP servers for redundancy. Your network is scheduled for every segment within the network. And, and this means that, that we need a DHCP agent available and connected to every single one of the segments within the network. So as an, as an admin or an operator, uh, the way that you'll roll out routed networks is first you'll want to prepare your, your physical environment. Um, we've gone with one FISNET per segment. Uh, so you, uh, let's say you're going for one, one segment per rack. Uh, you, you create your VLANs within each rack. And guess what? You can actually use, since the FIS, FISNETs are unique, uh, per segment, you can reuse VLAN numbering between, between your FISNETs, which is kind of cool. Uh, you also need to plan for a DHP agent for each FISNET. And then your choice of routing architecture. Um, it's up to you. The next thing is to configure Neutron. So Kevin showed you the bridge mappings. Uh, in ML2, uh, we're actually, one of the things I'm really excited about is we've got this project, we're not just doing this in ML2, we're actually doing this in OVN in parallel. And we intend to release this feature e uh, equally for both plugins. Uh, they'll have their own way to provide, provide the mappings from hosts to FISNETs or, or segments. Once you have those in place, um, there's the network creation, and, and Kevin also showed you this one. Uh, but you're going to want to create multiple, uh, multiple segments under the network instead of just a single segment. And forgive me, I actually don't know if that's possible in the Neutron CLI. I, I never looked. I had a to-do to look, and I. You, I've always used the API. So, in the API, um, you know the. The analog to neutron net create is is a post to the the network endpoint uh, with a JSON blob with with all of the attributes and and one of those is a list of segments and so um, you have a JSON attribute that's segments that's a list and e each one of those is the is the FISNET segmentation ID and what am I forgetting? The type, the segmentation type, um, that that tuple is uh, defines your segment. Uh, but by the time this is released in Newton, we'll have the ability to also come and create and delete these uh, after creating the network. Then there's creating your subnets, and this this is almost the same as it is today, except that with each subnet create, you want to include one more attribute. And that is the UUID of the segment to which you want that sub, subnet to, uh, to be on. So if you've got your four segments, like in my diagram at the beginning, uh, you'll do four segments, subnet creates at least. Um, and with each one, you'll provide the segment ID of one of those four segments. And then it's, it's pretty much available to you have a network now that's one single network. You're not presenting multiple networks to your end users uh, to allow for, um, for partitioning the network. You're, you're presenting one network. Uh, like Kevin said, the production or the, or the development network or the red and the blue network or, or however you want to distinguish those networks, uh, which simplifies things for the end user. Then, uh, we're, now I kind of want to, let me see how much time's left. Did you want any more time? No. Okay, cool. I'll go really quick through some stuff. This, this is kind of a stretch goal for Newton. Um, can we have floating IPs on these routed networks? Uh, floating IPs are IPs that aren't confined to 
the segment, but could be used anywhere within the network? And the answer is yes, we can do this, hopefully in Newton. I'd, I'd be ecstatic if we could get this into, into Newton, and we're going to try our best. Um, but we're going to use BGP to do this. And in Mitaka, we already have a BGP speaker in Neutron. And uh, that BGP project will be enhanced to be aware of segments. So that we can now, instead of just associating BGP with a network, we can associate BGP with a segment. And peer BGP with each one of, the, of those routers that, that's at the top of the segment. And so when we have floating IP subnets and those are allocated and bound to a port, we can actually use BGP to route those straight to the right segment and to the right uh, next hop for that, for that floating IP. And um, we can actually do this with or without a neutron router. Uh, so today, floating IPs are always one, you know, the floating IPs on one side of the neutron router and the fixed IPs on the other side of the new, neutron router. You, you pair the two and the neutron router takes care of natting net address translation. Um, we have to take care of net address. We have, we have to take care of the address somehow. And there are a couple of ways we could do this, and we haven't actually decided on which way to go with. Uh, one is uh, address translation on the port. Uh, another, which one of our operators actually does today, um, they actually use allowed address pairs on the port. And they allow that floating IP address to, to go straight into the VM. And then the VM understands that it has that floating IP address and can use it to communicate. And then another tricky part is DVR. But we haven't completely worked that out. But um, routing into tenant networks with DVR um, will eventually work with the magic of BGP and, and all of that cool stuff. So that's all I have. I'd like to open it up for questions for the last five minutes or so. Yeah. Excellent presentation. Probably uh, it's eye opener after a long time that we have such a huge uh, uh, improvement in uh, Neutron. I would like to ask a question. What is the impact of sub, uh, that is the port sub, supports for SFC, service function chaining? Did you look at that? What is it going to impact? And I, I'm just speculating. I don't know. So I'm trying to understand that. Right. If I'll you have honest, any thoughts on that. I'll be honest. That's not something I've thought about much. Have you thought about that? Uh, are you talking about the VLAN, VLAN aware VMs to allow uh, network or to allow instances to connect to different networks using VLAN tags is that what you mean by subports? Uh, no, right now I am thinking of new networking SFC as a project which supports subports for service function chaining. Since you are dealing with the port and you are doing a deferred binding, one thing is the IPAM is external IPAM. I don't know what's the impact of that. The other thing is, if we do a service function chaining, we need to chain the VMs. So certainly, I see there is a great advantage for this to put the network, uh, that is the, you put the graph of network first and then put the VMs on top of it. That's a good thinking. But how do we do it? What's the impact? I think we need a little more understanding. Yeah, I, I think we need more details about how networking SFC does that. and. We'll, we'll need to sync up with them to see if, if, if it'll be compatible with this at all. Even. Yeah, I'll ask Kathy, who is uh, and Furi to yeah. uh, work with you. Um, but excellent, okay. One of the best things I have seen in at least five summits, I would say. Oh, thank Sean. you. And, yeah. all right. um, go ahead. Hi, thank you for the presentation. So what you're presenting is taking one layer two network, slicing into pieces, and assigning it another ID so the host can attach to it. It kind of reminds me to Q and Q provider bridging, but you didn't mention it. So, how your solution differs from Q and Q? Thank you. <laughs>
So with Q and Q, you still have a VLAN that you're extending across the whole data center, right? In, in this case, the L2 boundary ends at the top of rack. It's, it's all routing from the top of rack onwards. So your, your L2 domain is, is just limited to this, this particular rack. And you have a router at the top of the rack, and then it's fully routed after that. So it, it's different from Q and Q in that uh, you're not extending L2 across the whole data center. Yeah, or w within some small domain, whatever the operator wants to set up. But yeah, it's, it's L2 within a very small domain, and then L3 beyond that. Yeah, yeah thanks. Uh, very interesting work as well. I echo that earlier comment. Just to be perfectly clear, the tenant is no longer specifying their own IP addresses. Just the first question. Second question is, can you talk about where isolation in the tenancy model is enforced with this model versus the existing OVS uh, segment model? Right. Uh, so a, a tenant can still, they'll still be able to specify an IP address, but it'll need to be passed to Neutron, or it, it, it will need to be taken into account in the Nova scheduling. There's a, yeah, you can. So this is kind of a, the, 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 the deployers who are asking this for this, they're not as interested in, in multi-tenant networking uh, with, with like the L3 agent routers and tenant and private networks. This, this is more of a shared provider network model. Um, although we are looking, this last slide shows we are looking at, at being able to take a router and connect its external gateway to a routed network and have that work too. In that case, then isolation is, is handled in the same way it is today because those isolated networks are tenant private and they're behind a router and all that. But this is more for a, a shared, I just want an IP address um, on the internet kind of model. So security groups is the only And security groups, yeah, is, is, is still there, right? Uh, so with the flexibility of uh, floating IPs that you're affording with some of the new work that's going into uh, Neutron, do you anticipate any overhauls or changes to the way the metrics and the telemetry data uh, for those things are going to be generated and stored? That's possible. I, I don't know. Yeah. Do you mean like the, the packet counters and that that are collected at the L3 agent? Yeah, that and uh, also like the isolation and collection of floating IPs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the usage statistics, like how many floating IPs are available, that kind of stuff. I, I think the number of floating IPs available, that, that should stay pretty similar for the for the packet count, for example, we'll have to make sure that the, wherever we do realize the translation at, we'll have to make sure that the IP tables counters that are in the L3 agent right now are carried over to wherever it's done, maybe on the L2 agent or something. Uh, one more? Yeah, so maybe you answer this in the second to last question, but what I'm seeing here is a really kick-ass underlay network, but is there no way that we could have a, a you know, tenant isolated overlays on top of this? Well, yeah, the, the overlays, you can still have tenants create networks. Mm -hmm. and, and you can still have them create routers and connect those, those routers. This, this would be the shared external network that you set your router external gateway to. Okay, so the external network is, is right. per one per rack instead of having a single L2 external network right. across all my racks. Yeah, this, this works yeah. as that. And, and guess what? It also works as I just want to boot my VM straight to the external network. Okay, but we're still restricted in having to live migrate within the single external network. Right. But yeah, this is, I mean, this is... Right, this weird. does restrict live migration okay. and, and any other move of a VM. Right, but it's uh, within a rack, so you know. it's okay. I mean, this is what we've been waiting for for years. Right. This is kick-ass. Cool. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks to Kevin. He's, he's really driven this a lot. I've presented a lot of ideas. He's told me I'm crazy, and I come back with another idea, and we finally settled on something good. So I'm really excited about this, and thank you for coming.